In this section, we'll cover a couple of options for renting Elasticsearch clusters in the cloud. This can save you the time of provisioning and starting up your own servers, and it can also save you a lot of money, since you can just purchase exactly the capacity you need for as long as you need it for. Amazon Web Services offers an Elasticsearch service that lets you quickly spin up Elasticsearch clusters on Amazon EC2 instances, and we'll start there. If you want to go even farther, Elastic.co offers its own hosted solution on top of AWS, which has even more features and is even easier to use. It's called the Elastic Cloud, and we'll see how that works too. Bear in mind the activities in this section cost real money. While you're free to set up an AWS or Elastic Cloud account and follow along, you might just want to watch if you don't want to put your own credit card on the line here. It won't cost much, but you probably shouldn't risk forgetting to shut down your cluster when you're done and then getting billed for an entire month of usage that you didn't need. Either way, you'll see how it works and what these services offer. Let's do this. Let's dive into Amazon's Elasticsearch service, or Amazon ES for short. This is an offering from Amazon Web Services, and if you just want to rent capacity on a cluster hosted in the cloud and you don't want to deal with maintaining your own cluster, Amazon ES is a great option for doing that really quickly and really easily. It's also pretty cheap, but it does cost real money, so just follow along and watch this video if you don't have an AWS account and you don't want to put your own wallet on the line here. Mainly, I just want to give you an overview of how to use Amazon ES and what it can do and how to use it and what it's capable of. Now, for the most part, Amazon ES is just a bare bones Elasticsearch server and Kibana installed, pre-installed for you. So if all you need is straight up Elasticsearch and Kibana, Amazon ES might be just fine for your purposes. Main thing that's different is how it handles security. So since it's hosted on the cloud, there's some extra hoops you have to jump through in order to securely attach to your Amazon ES cluster. So it has all the Amazon security stuff and identity access management stuff built into it and integrated into it. So that's the main difference that we'll wrangle with as we try to communicate with it outside of our cluster. So let's dive in and see how it all works. So again, using AWS and Amazon Elasticsearch does cost real money. So you probably just want to watch here as opposed to following along. But I already have an Amazon Web Services account, so I'm going to start by signing into the console from aws.amazon.com using my existing account. And from here, spinning up a new Elasticsearch cluster is pretty easy. All you have to need to do is search for uh, Elasticsearch under the Services menu here, and you'll find it there, Elasticsearch Service. And creating a new cluster is pretty easy. It goes by the name of a domain in Amazon, so we'll click on Create a New Domain. This will basically be the name of your cluster. Now start by configuring your domain name. This is kind of like your cluster name. Now it does have to be all lowercase, uh, so there are don't do any uppercase characters or special characters. Just uh, alphanumeric and hyphens are all that's allowed. So let's call it, I don't know, uh, franks-es. And select whatever version of Elasticsearch you want. It is a couple of revisions behind at this point, but as time goes on, more current versions will be offered. Elasticsearch moves quickly and they, uh, they have to keep up. All right, now you can actually configure the properties of your cluster here, and you can specify how many nodes you want in your cluster and what instance types you want. And like we talked about when we reviewed the hardware requirements for Elasticsearch, a large instance is usually a good choice. You know, you want something that's pretty beefy and has a good amount of RAM for the most optimal performance. You also want at least three instances in the real world that will give you some redundancy at least and redundancy across data centers potentially. Uh, we will stick with the default storage configuration uh, it is backed by an SSD. Again, that goes back to our recommendations when we were talking about Elasticsearch hardware requirements. So for the most part, you can stick with the defaults here. And it automatically takes a snapshot of your cluster as well for you automatically as well. So you don't have to worry about backups either. You can specify the hour at which that occurs every day for you. If you open up the advanced options, there are some more things you can play with here. Normally, you won't have to mess with this. Um, there are instances where you might want to manually adjust the cache size and and if you need to configure security at the index level, then you'll want to mess around with this setting here, but that's a fairly unusual thing to do. So we'll uh, skim past that one for now. So we're gonna go ahead and create a cluster in the cloud using m4.large.elasticsearch hardware types, three of them in our little mini cluster. And go ahead and hit next. And here's where we set up the access policy. So this is how we select who has access to actually connect to this server. Now, by default, obviously you don't want your Elasticsearch server sitting out there in the cloud open to the entire world. It'll probably take about 10 minutes for hackers to find it and bring it down. So you need to be very explicit about who has access to this cluster. So since I'm gonna be accessing this through my home, through my cable modem here in my home office, I can set an access policy to my IP address. So let's say, allow access to the domain from the specific IPs. 
And this allows me to put in a list of specific IP addresses that I want to have permission to access this cluster. So I can go to a tool like um, whatismyip.com or something like that to figure out the IP address that the outside world sees my cable modem as. And yeah, that can change potentially, but for the sake of illustration, let's just use that for now. So today, my IP address is this. I'm just gonna copy and paste it in here, and that should automatically create an access policy definition that grants access to this cluster only from my IP address. And you can see there's this whole JSON-y format thing here that allows you to specify more complex access policies. And we'll look at that later on when we try to open things up to our Logstash instance as well. But for now, we're just gonna open it up to our own little IP address here to the domain franks-es. Let's hit next. All right, so we just need to review everything, make sure it looks good and hit confirm and off it goes. So now we just have to wait for it to uh, spin up. And we can see right now the domain is loading and it will take about 10 minutes to, before this actually comes up and is available for use. When that happens, this will change from status loading to status active. And once in a while, you might wanna hit this refresh button just to make sure that that information is getting uh, updated. So let's go ahead and come back when that's done. All right, about 10 minutes have passed and our cluster is now active. And a few things to point out here on the dashboard. First of all, this endpoint is gonna be very important for you. This is the domain name, the actual host name that you're gonna to use to connect to your cluster with. So all throughout this course, we've been connecting to our local host by, by connecting to 127.0.0.1 colon 9200. But to use this cluster instead, we're going to use this host name instead. Search dash whatever your domain name is dash some big cryptic string followed by the region that it was created within, amazonaws.com. So that's gonna be our new endpoint that we talk to to communicate with our cluster. Uh, we also have a link to Kibana that we'll play with a little bit later. And you can see here that we did indeed spin up three nodes in our cluster. It's sitting there waiting for us to do something with it. Also worth noting this modify access policy button. It is possible to change your access policies after this cluster has spun up without taking it down and bringing it back up again in the process. So if you do need to change your access policies to modify the IPs that have access to it or provide access to specific AWS accounts or users, you can do that without affecting the availability of your cluster in the process, which is kind of nice. Also, I want to point out the delete Elasticsearch domain area down here. If you open that up, You'll see that's where you go about to delete this domain when you're done with it. And remember, we are being billed for every hour that this thing is up and running. So if you are playing along here, don't forget to delete this when you're done messing around with it or else you're gonna get a nasty surprise on your credit card at the end of the month. So let's go ahead and copy this endpoint and see if we can use it. So we have set things up to open things up to my desktop here. So let's go ahead back to my terminal that's running on my desktop and see if I can actually communicate with this server. So let's say curl-xget and we'll just hit the endpoint and see if we can talk to it. I just hit right click there to paste that in. And cool, there we have it. So we are getting back a Elasticsearch 5.3.2 cluster. Seems to be responding. Let's uh, go ahead and put some data into it. So let's upload our movies data that we've done before on our local cluster and put this into a real cluster of three actual nodes running on AWS's cloud. So let's say uh, curl-x put, and I'll paste in that endpoint again. And this time we'll say, note that I'm leaving off the, uh, the port name. It doesn't need that in this case. Underscore bulk pretty data binary at movies.json. That's my bulk import data that, I'm still, that I still have in my home directory here. And off it goes. And that uploaded pretty darn quickly. So even though it's going over the cloud, uh, it's still quite efficient. Let's see if we can actually use Kibana to visualize that data, shall we? So we created a movies index and we can just click on this Kibana link since I did open everything up to my IP address here at home, it should open right up. And sure enough, here we have our very familiar Kibana UI here. Let's go ahead and create an index pattern for movies. We do not have time-based events in this, and we'll say create. And sure enough, there's our movies index there. And we can visualize it, play around with it, whatever you want to do. Pretty cool stuff. Let's just go to the Discover tab and mess around. We can see a, we only have five examples in this little tiny data set that we imported. Uh, but it's there, so very cool. Uh, let's just do, I don't know, search for star. And we get back the two movies that have star in the title. So it works. <laughs> cool stuff. So, you know, uh, we can also go to DevTools, do queries there by hand if we want to. Works the same way as we saw before. We'll dismiss all that stuff. 
Uh, so for example, you could enter a basic JSON query here. This actually returns everything. Execute that and get back the uh, JSON request for match all. Get back all the results in the database. So it works. I think that's kind of awesome. So we have an actual cluster running in the cloud for real. Let's do something more interesting with it next and actually hook up Logstash to it so we can do more than just mess around with movies data using Kibana.